Hello everybody and welcome to today's episode of Activist Lawyer. I am delighted to be joined in the studio by Gary Daly, solicitor. Hi Gary. Hi Sarah. And you made the effort to come. So delighted to have you here in person. Not a bad journey, a good journey up to Newry. Grand journey, yeah. Grand no journey. problem. Well, just to get us started, I am going to go through um, some of Gary's bio here, uh, just to familiarise yourse- ourselves with your work, and then we'll get into some of the cases um, that you're working on as well. So Gary qualified as a solicitor in 2001 and started his own practice in 2006, merging with IK and Co, am I right, yeah, in 2021. And he's now practicing under the firm Daily Kershaw solicitors. Gary has a law degree from UCD and several legal diplomas including a diploma in immigration and asylum law from King's Inns. Daily Kershaw Solicitors provides a wide range of services including commercial as well, asylum, immigration, housing, social welfare, equality and discrimination, education, equality and protected disclosures among other areas. They provide consultations and legal support to organisations like the Irish Network for Against Racism, Places of Sanctuary, Migrant Rights Centre of Ireland, Traveller Action to name but a few. The firm has consistently provided pro bono legal advice to a wide range of social justice groups for many years. Gary is also co-chair of the Socialist Lawyers Association of Ireland, the founder of Lawyers Against Racism and a committee member of Lakela and Ireland for All. He was recently appointed to the Human Rights and Equality Committee of the Law Society of Ireland. Gary was an active member of the Ireland-Palestine Solidarity Campaign for many years and now continues to work closely with the organisation providing legal advice and stewarding. Gary's been to Palestine to speak on issues related to the occupation. In his personal capacity, Gary has spent many years working on campaigns supporting refugees, travelling to refugee camps and working with displaced people in France, Greece, Turkey, Lebanon, Palestine, South Africa and Ukraine. He ran the campaign Not On Our Watch following the French government's announcement of the closure and demolition of the jungle refugee camp in Calais. The campaign resulted in the Irish government's commitment to bring 200 unaccompanied minors from the camp to Ireland. Gary continues to volunteer in refugee camps, both providing legal and logistical support, and he's heavily involved in solidarity campaigning, focusing most recently on the rise of anti-refugee protests springing up around Dublin. He was involved in the well-attended Ireland for All demonstration in February this year. Gary has been extremely active around the issue of homelessness, previously acting as a board member for Inner City Helping Homeless. Gary acted as an election monitor in in Kurdish Southern Turkey, and recently spoke at the Doyle Committee on Anti-Racism in his spare time. I don't know how you have spare time. <laughs> but Gary is a boxing coach and a purple belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Gary, thank you so much again for joining me today. Thanks, Sarah. Wow, where do we start? I mean, even just reading your bio, anybody listening to this, we're recording here on a Friday afternoon in Uri, and even since I've been speaking to Gary last, so much has happened that actually um, you know, reflects a lot of your work there. Um, and firstly to say you've joined me from Dublin today after experiencing one of the most horrific scenes of violence that I've ever witnessed in Dublin um, so I mean we'll get to that and I'm still a bit shocked just by, by seeing it I'm sure you are um, uh, and that and a lot of your work there obviously with what's happening in Palestine at the moment um, it'll be great to have you know your perception and your experience and talk us through your work there sure. but just taking us back in time a little bit before we get to your work how did it all begin um why law why why human rights law what spurred you on um so i suppose to go way back in time way back from <laughs> um, my childhood my parents they yeah. they were my inspiration and right. continue to be my inspiration um both very involved in community activism um they're both from leitrim but when they moved to dublin moved into uh, a newly built estate in Donahmead, the Donahies, and there were no support, there were no services there, there were no supports, no community centres, anything. And my father and mother were extremely active in advocating on behalf of the community there. Um, I have lots of interesting stories to tell for maybe another time, but <laughs> um, around the dinner table as well, just listening to my, my father and mother talking about current affairs in Ireland and, yeah. and internationally as well. So I always had an awareness. My, my parents, my father particularly, brought me on lots of marches since uh, really? since I was a young fella. So um, I always had an aware w- awareness of injustice in the world um, and how... Um, people everybody should get involved to try and to try and make the world a better place yeah. and to fight against injustice 
Yeah. And I mean, your career started, I suppose you, you qualified back in 2001. You set up your own firm pretty quickly after qualifying. Mm. And now you've merged with um, another practice. Is your, so the work primarily focuses on, is it immigration and asylum or a general kind of human rights provision? And maybe you might talk about the services you provide in some of the cases that you've worked on that, that stand out for you. Sure. So I uh, worked for um, a firm on Thomas Street for nine years. John Gaynor, who's a, a wonderful man, really wonderful man. And um, he always had a very compassionate way of dealing with his clients, although he wouldn't have necessarily a human rights practice per se. Mm. was always a v- and it continues to be a very decent human being. Um, I started up my own practice in 2006. And one of my first employees was Imran Khurshid who uh, is now my business partner, Imran then went off, uh, set up his own practice. Uh, He qualified as a barrister in the meantime, but Mm. then went qualified as a solicitor. Imran uh, is from Pakistan uh, and he specialized in immigration. Um, We, when I set up my own practice, we did general practice, civil um, stuff, conveyancing and family law, probate, and the human rights work as well, and insolvency as well. Mm. Uh, And when the recession hit then, Unfortunately, I had to lay off lots of staff, like right, lots yeah. of people, and I ended up in difficult circumstances myself. And um, I really um, felt very strongly about how badly people were treated, um, and particularly those at the, you know, in the margins of society. Um, when the when the cutbacks happened, uh, you know, all the support groups were defunded. Um, and stuff that I had been involved in was really impacted, you know, homeless and stuff and, um, you know, travellers' rights groups, all that kind of mm. stuff was defunded or underfunded. And um, I just felt re- like that really was the impetus for me. I had always been involved in stuff before. Yeah. Um, and that also coincided with my first trip to Palestine oh, uh, really? in 2010. So the recession happened and I went to Palestine at the same time. And that really just... For me, um, as I say, I had been involved in stuff before, yeah. uh, but that really focused my mind. And then I really decided to, to throw myself yeah. um, headfirst into doing whatever I could, as not only as an activist, but also as a lawyer. So sure. that's why I love the name of this podcast, Activist Lawyer. I yeah. think all lawyers should be activists. Good. Well, you certainly are. And I mean, I'm just imagining the life of a, a solicitor with your own practice and all of those cases that you have to handle and being, keeping on top of all of, you know, the, the changes around those areas of law that you work in. And I know some are very topical at the moment, immigration, obviously, and also around social um, housing issues as well and welfare. But just um, you're, we mentioned there in the bio that you're also the co-chair of the uh, Socialist Lawyers Association of Ireland. Mm. Have you been involved in the organisation for long or how did that come about? And I suppose, what do you see as the, the relevance of being involved in the organisation, um, you know, as it plays into your work? Uh, well, firstly, I should say that the Socialist Lawyers Group was set up last year. The impetus for setting it up last year came from a group of students in Blackhall Place. Oh, OK. Um, and... Uh, they're a great group of young people and they approached me and asked me to be co-chair of the organisation but I I cannot claim credit for either Mm -hmm. the idea or the impetus it was a a group of young uh, trainee lawyers, solicitors specifically in Blackhall Place last year they approached me and I agreed and I was delighted to be approached Um, and I do, like as a socialist myself um, Mm -hmm. you know, and I believe we all should be socialists um, it, it absolutely marries with my own principles, so mm. I'm very happy to do so. We've lots of ambitions for for uh, the work that the SLAY, as we call it, Socialist Lawyers Association of Ireland. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, f- we've lots of ambitions, like housing is a huge issue, yeah. a really huge, huge. issue. Um, so um, we are... Like my my firm provides lots of pro bono advice and represents people in in housing difficulty, and other lawyers involved in say do the same. So we're trying to work towards setting up something more formalized where yeah. advice could be given to people rather than individuals in the organization, but formalize something that Slay could do itself. Mm-hmm. And obviously, we're very concerned about issues like um, you know the rise of the far right as well. So Slayer trying to figure out how exactly we, we deal with that too. It's a very new organisation. It was only the end of last yeah. year that it was founded. But um, 
lots of really good people and particularly good. really good young lawyers that's involved. That's great. Great, great ideas, great yeah. energy, great impetus. You know? I think that's what you need. And I mean, it comes at a, a good time. I mean, there's going to be plenty of work and plenty of um, areas for you to focus on um, that we'll we'll get to as well. And then just in terms of feeding into your own work, I, I guess the immigration and asylum work you do, I, I'm familiar with that, having practiced in Dublin myself. It can be quite heavy at times. I mean, some of the cases you're working with very, very vulnerable people. And I know you've ho- focused a lot, as you said, there on housing being an issue. Are there any cases that you can talk about that kind of stand out in terms of your firm and the services that you've provided or... Yeah, well, I probably the most, the, the best known case I often, you know, if people are saying what cases have been involved in, mm. Apollo House, I don't know if you recall mm. that, um, or a group of activists. That's right. Um, yeah. uh, uh, the, so the, there was three prongs to it, the activist prong, the trade unions, and the artists. Um, and together that, that group took over an office block. And um, it was a symbolic gesture, but... At the same, uh, and so it was at a time when ha- homelessness and rough sleeping, particularly, was yeah. was particularly hitting the news. I think it was two thousand sixteen, and um, it was felt that something really, you know, strong and some, you know, a really strong statement needed to be made. So this is a big office block that was um, in the control of NAMA. Uh, it was in the city in the city centre. And lots of people, um, l- like, it was unbelievable. Yeah. I, I put on over a stone because there was food there all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was un- unbelievable. Lots of Remember people contributed it, yeah. money and um, the artists the were artists fantastic. The artists were, re- Glenn Hansard, I remember Glenn being Hansard, heavily yeah. involved. Yeah. But uh, um, the owners of the building, the receiver actually brought proceedings then to, to get an injunction to, to remove everybody from the building, including the rough sleepers. And uh, my office represented those who were, uh, in occupation and we engaged uh, council as well friends of mine uh, who agreed to uh, represent pro bono as well Ross McGuire and Michael Lynn senior counsel um, but that case was fascinating and I actually met the high court judge uh, who was the presiding judge I won't name him but uh, mm-hmm. the presiding judge recently and I complimented him on how fairly he oh, good, he yeah. uh, handled the case I felt certainly but um yeah, the case was fascinating. We had, um, so the, you know, the injunction proceedings were brought and we submitted lots of affidavits then to, to provide evidence to say, well, look, there are not enough beds in Dublin at the moment to provide accommodation for all the rough sleepers on the streets. Um, so this is effectively filling in for where Dublin City Council and the government generally are, are failing in their duties to, um, you know, people living in Ireland. Yeah. And... Um, there were lots of really interesting arguments in the, in the case. The senior counsel against us is the current Attorney General, Rossa Fanning. Um, so, uh, yeah, there was lots of really, really interesting legal argument at the time. It was really particularly, um, you know, there was an awful lot of emotion. The outcome then? The outcome, um, well, I think the outcome was always going to be that, the, you know, unless the judge was going to mm. effectively change the constitution yeah. nearly um, there wasn't much more that the judge could do yeah. you know he, we, we were asking him to give us six months there but as it was he gave us three weeks and it okay. was three weeks over Christmas mm-hmm. he could have made the order so the, 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 yeah. the initial application was made Christmas week I think maybe the 19th 20th 21st of December and um uh, the judge could have made the order, and they, uh, the judge norm- a judge in that position normally would make an yeah. order that everybody is out immediately. immediately. Left us there until I think the sixth or seventh of January, mm. so that gave us all that time to raise awareness yeah. for the artists, particularly to get in front of the cameras. Um, you know, and lots of advocacy was done. In the long term, um, you know, it certainly raised the profile. Yeah. I felt that more could have been done as a collective afterwards, mm. but, you know, lots of people had lots of different ideas. But, you know, there were lots of really people that were really, really committed to it. Brendan Ogle, uh, Glenn Hansard, Carrie Hennessy. Um, they were the, um, oh, I'm forgetting lots of names here now, people that um, put their names forward uh, as uh, those who would swear affidavits. Yeah. And they were then in the firing line for costs, as wow. you can imagine. Gosh, you know? yes. Um, and... They took that risk because they felt it was the principal yeah. thing to do. So there was a lot of courage shown by a lot of people. 
you it know. really was and it's definitely an interesting um, one to work on both from a campaigning perspective and highlighting that uh, the awareness and um, we had Aoife Desmond Kelly on before just about the extraordinary cases that she's dealing with across the country I mean a lot of the work used to be focused just in Dublin mm. and now it's so nationwide the problem of homelessness evictions I mean you hear it every day I suppose you're still busy with with, with clients who are still suffering from the, the, the single evictions. most regular phone call we get in terms of, 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 of what area of law mm. or what, what issue is evictions and homelessness. Is it? Yeah. yeah, it's really, really extraordinary. We have a case next Tuesday in the RTB. We're representing, I think we're going to be representing two sets of clients who are being, it's a, it's a mass eviction out of a, a, a large building. Right. Um, but it really is just extraordinary. And since the, since the eviction ban ended at the yeah. end of COVID, um, evictions have just gone through gone the crazy. roof. Yeah. Awful. And you've a heavy focus, your firm, on equality and discrimination cases in general. And I know mm. you've worked on LGBTQ plus discrimination matters, Roma, traveller cases as well. Mm-hmm. I'm also interested in um, some of the specific areas you work on, the education equality as well, which really kind of struck me. I know that you were involved in, wasn't it, high court proceedings at one point against the Minister for Justi- or for Education on yeah. a, an area that I'm just personally just interested in finding out how that went. It was around baptism and... Yeah, so there was a requirement... Uh, sorry. So the, the case involved, and she was a, a, a friend of mine to this day, um, she uh, is non-religious mm-hmm. and she had two sons and she applied to the local schools in her area. And um, because she wasn't from the area, she didn't have other children in the schools ahead of her. She didn't meet the other, her children didn't meet the other criteria. They were bumped down the the list. And she was told by, unofficially, by several schools that because your child is not baptised, you know, mm. th- this is a, a Christian faith school, this is a Christian brother school or sure. whatever else, that, you know, if they were baptised, that, that might bump them up the criteria a bit. And she said, but why should that be? Because yeah. this is a state-funded school, it mm-hmm. should not be the way it is. So we, we, we took a case, um, we... Uh, we brought the proceedings. We had two eminent senior counsels involved in the case. And um, certainly we believe that the, the state opened a non-denominational Educate Together school in the area within 11 months. So that wow. our and our our clients' sons were admitted to, the, to, to, that, to that school. That school. So our cause of action was rendered moot. But so at the we, same time, yeah. But, but the following year, then yeah. the the relevant legislation was amended. So exactly, I, so I believe that my client's courage in taking that case was certainly a, a, a very and one of the junior counsels involved in the case as well. Um, really, really brilliant young woman, and she was a real driver in that case yeah. as well. The client and the the junior counsel actually were really fantastic. I'm just fascinated at this day and age that that still is something, you know, that that, that barrier is still there. And I know this, it's in the South there's so many Educate Together schools now springing up for that reason. Yeah. Here, unfortunately, we are still miles and miles behind. Mm. But it's something that I really think is crucial if we want to advance all of the problems that we see. It has to come from education, especially in Northern Ireland. There's a particular issue there around, you know, the failure of schools integrating. It's just horrendous and it's still Mm. very much controlled by, um, you know, the religious institutions, which poses huge problems, I think, going forward. Absolutely. And it's definitely um, outside, you know, the Good Friday Agreement intention. So huge problems there, but I'm glad to see. It's a great case to have brought and that's a really good um, outcome overall. So just going back and I see in my, my bio there when I introduced Gary um, the amount of time that you've spent physically volunteering so not just in Ireland with the organisations and I know your firm has provided pro bono advice to lots of fantastic organisations there are some of them I'm very very familiar with um, which is you know just such a valuable resource for them but why or how did it come about that you ended up visiting refugee camps and actually working there how did you kind of did that was that part of your work or is that something completely separate when you uh, so um, the impetus for that came from a very good friend of mine uh, Quiva Butterly I don't know if you've heard of yes. Quiva um, she organised a trip to uh, we went to Lesbos in two thousand and fourteen or fifteen um, she had already gone uh, over there and had travelled that Balkan route with some refugee. 
uh, some asylum seekers and um, she felt really strongly when like she's a lifelong activist yeah. and a really Fantastic. brilliant woman and she approached me and a number of others and said look do you want to come to Lesbos I said absolutely yeah it sounds and she sold us on you know what we could do over there as activists and as mm. as people who are you know feel strongly about the rights of others um, so we, I went to Lesvos with Quiva. We were there for a couple of weeks with, you know, some really other, some brilliant other friends of mine as well who I'm still friendly to this day with. And it was a really intense couple of weeks because at that time there was 5,000 people landing per day on Lesvos. Wow. Um, mm-hmm. So we, I hired a van and I was driving people from the shore to, <laughs> to the different camps. Um, one incident in particular, um, I had bought myself a pair of waders <laughs> and... Uh, I was wading into the sea to help make it easier for people to come in on these boats because they're, you know, they're, they're liable to capsize at any time and particularly coming to the shore with the waves chopping and that. Mm. Um, but normally when the boats would be coming to the shore, uh, they'd be singing. Be, um, right. You know, the people on the boats would be singing because they're, you know, they think they have reached yeah. safety and, yeah. uh, you know, a, a safe harbour for them. But they, little did they realise the racism that they were to meet within the wow. EU. But... <laughs> That's another story. But this particular day, they were shouting and calling for me to hurry up, hurry up and, and, and help. A woman had gone into labour oh on goodness. the boat. So I lifted her from the boat and carried her to the shore. And I don't have children. I, you know, I'm no expert in this area whatsoever. But there were two friends of mine, Damien McCormick, who's a doctor, and Helen Lawler, who's a nurse. And they were absolute. they took over and they were just... Wow. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And they, they calmed the woman down. Her family were with her as well. Uh, and then it's right. So we I carried her up the rocks then to the to the van. Uh, Helen sat in the back of the van with the woman's head in her lap and Damien sat in the front with me and I drove slowly, you know, over. And we drove from one side of the island to the other, got them to the hospital and she gave birth to a little baby girl. Um, but that was just one of the most intense experiences in my life. Um, now, I claim very little credit for that. Helen and, and Damien were extraordinary. Wow. And her family were brilliant as well, really? by the way. Her her other children Aww. were just, they were wonderful, you know. But that was a really, so that was um, when I saw what could be done mm. to help people, not just from a legal perspective. I was giving legal advice to people while I was there. Okay. I distinctly remember being on the, on the harbour and uh, a group of Yazidi people had landed on a boat um, and they were from Iraq and they had been really, really badly treated by ISIS in in uh, Iraq. And I had a long conversation with kind of the patriarch of the family, an older man who spoke English with an American accent that he'd learned from the television. Mm-hmm. And he was trained as a doctor and I was, you know, he was saying, where are you from? And you seem like a good guy. And I was, you're an amazing guy. And, you know, my God, everything you've been through. We had this long, and really interesting conversation. And um, he was saying, we're, my family plan to go to Germany because we've heard that this is the best place to go. And I said, why don't you come to Ireland? Because, And Quiva came over to me and put her hand on my shoulder and said, Gary, direct provision. And that I had protested against direct provision before yeah. I had left Ireland and I knew the injustices and how awful it was. But that really, that because this man was in front of me with all his family and I was thinking, these people will be wonderful. What a benefit to Ireland to have these brilliant and wonderful and talented people coming to live in our country. And they were facing, now direct provision has been reformed a little bit, but it's still a terrible, yeah. like I've lots of clients Awful having to system. suffer through that system. Uh, but that really, um, Quiva just in her in her strong but gentle and compassionate way just put her hand on my shoulder and said Gary direct provision and it just that hit me over the head like a sledgehammer and um, I'll, I'll never forget that moment but yeah so that that anyway to go back to the question uh, that couple of weeks in Lesvos that really showed me that direct activism with people where they need it can, is is really effective there is other things that can be done as well um so I worked a- after Lesvos then some of the people who had been in Lesvos had also been in Calais the, the, a few months mm-hmm. beforehand in the jungle. And they were telling me about that and they were saying, look, God, you really should go there because if you feel strongly about this, then it's a slightly different dynamic. But, you know, there's lots you could do there as well. So I started, so I used to go there every month, you know, really? I, I, for two years I was going there a lot. I spent Christmas and there. Stay and stay there. Everything. I didn't stay in right in the yeah, camp. I, I slept Cali. overnight a few yeah. times, but yeah. I'd stay in a in a cheap hotel in in 
Calais and then travel mm-hmm. in and out to the camp My every goodness. day. It was only a minute or two in and out. But um, I distinctly remember um, being in the camp. So the French government had announced the demolition of one half of the camp and the half of the camp that um, was demolished, I had raised a lot of money. Uh, lots of us had, like this isn't me, this is lots of us have been mm-hmm. involved in campaigning in Ireland to raise money to build structures in the camp to make it habitable for people because, you know, the French government were given nothing. Medicine Sans Frontier took the French government to court to inf- to force them to put port into the camp. Really? Yeah. That's, you know, the basic, like, like the, the, denial, the, the ba- yeah. But sh- the camp was ringed by the CRS. Every night they would fire tear gas into the camp. It was just the, the brutalization <coughs> of the people in the camp was really, really awful. Um, but uh, so the French government announced the demolition of one half of the camp. So everybody squashed into what was already cramped and really, you know, unsanitary conditions. Yeah. They crammed then into the other. So ten thousand people living in wow. this camp, in in you know in makeshift, yeah. you know, uh, you wouldn't even call them houses. Mm-hmm. Like they were, you know, shacks. Um, and then they announced the demolition of the second half of the camp. And I at this stage I had started to bring. Um, people over to advocate. I, init- my initial focus was on building structures, and we built a boxing club. And I used to give boxing coaching Way. over there. <laughs> yeah, um, but then as time went on, so I had a number of conversations with really good friends of mine who were living in the camp, Afghan friends, Sudanese mm. friends, and um, they were, you know, I was saying that what more can I do? What more can I help you with? And they said, look, d- bringing us over food, clothes medicine all that stuff is great but it's a sticking plaster what yeah. we need is to get from where we are now to where we want to go to. and the vast majority of them wanted to go to to britain to mm-hmm. family and friends or they could speak english and they you know they believed that that was the place they needed to go um so uh, and, and i also remember very distinctly being in the camp on the night that the the um amendment to the immigration uh, the immigration act was passed and Lord Dubbs, Lord Alfred Dubbs in the House of Lords insisted on an amendment to the act that th- the British government would commit to bring in 3,000 unaccompanied minors from uh, various places across um, Greece, France, okay, Italy. Yeah. And kids in the camp, so I remember it was like Ireland had won the World Cup or okay. whatever, you know, that kind yeah. of that kind of sense of jubilation. Oh. And, you know, because they were they were putting their lives at risk. They were trying to jump on moving lorries to mm-hmm. get, and lots of kids that I knew now were killed, uh, you know, trying to get from there. And all they were trying to do was get across a border. You know, that's oh a goodness. whole other conversation. Mm-hmm. But I, I, that stuck. That always stuck with me, the yeah. Dubs Amendment. And a, a really great man, Lord great Alfred man. Dubs. Beca- he had been yeah. part of the Kinder Transport right. Programme after, you know, he was a Jewish oh. refugee, he came from Germany brought to England and he had made a great life for himself so he thought well why wouldn't I advocate for these mm. kids in the same position he's a legend yeah a, an absolute mm. legend of a man in his 90s and still mm. advocating but uh, so when the French government announced the demolition of the second half of the camp then I started that campaign that you mentioned in the en- in the introduction the, the Not In Our Watch campaign Not and In I, Our Watch yes yeah and I involved in Quiva and lots of other brilliant fantastic people including a good friend of mine Fintan Drury who, who was instrumental mm-hmm. um, but that when you ask me you know going to camps and seeing you're not going to understand really what needs to be done in camps until you've been you're there, there yeah you know of and, but also I think it's really important like you and I as lawyers we know the law on mm-hmm. asylum law mm-hmm. and the Geneva conventions and the refugee mm-hmm. convention and but it's not until you meet the people that you understand why do people go from one place to another and you hear the far right oh they should stay in the in the country beside yeah. it yeah. until you realize take syria for example uh the country closest to it to its west is lebanon mm-hmm. population of lebanon is six million of that six million two million are syrian refugees, refugees. and seven hundred fifty thousand yeah. are palestinians so a third of the population are already refugees, refugees and they're yeah. living in terrible conditions so wouldn't you like i would if I were, you know, fleeing a war, I'd, I'd want my family to live somewhere better than, you know, somewhere yeah. that's slightly, there's just no bombs falling yeah, on me, absolutely. but it's, it's still, so of course you're going to go to somewhere better yeah. to make a better chance for your, your children. 
Yes, and then we hear loud and clear the Tory mantra, stop the boats, using migrants as scapegoats for their epic failure. But as you say, every one of those people are coming from, you know, severe trauma. Many of them will they will have their own individual stories and their own plight. This is all rubbished by the press and suppressed by a government that's intent on imposing inhumane and extremely restrictive immigration laws, um, which we talk about a lot on this programme. But Gary... We are in day one of a temporary ceasefire in Gaza. So at the time of recording this, um, we're at day one on the, the Friday here. And when this airs, we'll not know what the position is in respect of this pause, humanitarian pause, they're calling it, on the bombardment of innocent men, women and children in the region. Many of us, you know, have been keeping an eye on Palestine and um, the occupied territories for decades, um, working with Palestinian people or like you directly and consistently involved in activism around um, the ending of the occupation. But regardless, I just don't think any of us can look at what is unfolding now without feeling sheer horror, grief and utter dismay. Um, So in recent weeks, what have you taken from the crisis that's unfolding before our eyes? Well, from a legal practice perspective, we've had lots of consultations with people in the West Bank, Mm -hmm. um, people in Ramallah and different places um, who want to get out because people don't realise that the violence in the West Bank has, has, you know, this year has been extraordinarily bad, the worst since the first intifada. And um, there are people who... um, I, I just I'm very reluctant to give specific details mm. might identify them but there are people with connections to Ireland who want yeah. to get out of the West Bank and travel to Ireland and unfortunately it's extremely difficult for them you know and you as an immigration lawyer you know this yourself it's virtually impossible it's really really yeah. difficult and even um, you know we can't advise them to travel and claim no. asylum um, all we can do is give them the law on it yeah. um, but what you know what's what I find extraordinary, and this is nothing against the Israeli people per se, but um, Israeli people can travel visa free to Ireland, but Palestinian people can't. You know, and I just I I find that very difficult. Um, not like I am delighted the Israeli yeah. people can travel visa free to Ireland. Um, I think that's a good thing. Mm-hmm. However, why Israeli and not Palestinian people? You know, I, I just don't understand why we have to differ- differentiate between no. people who are living in exactly the same area. In the same area. That's, yeah, that's hard to stomach. But also what's hard to stomach is that when obviously the crisis in Ukraine happened in, um, back in February last year, countries, EU countries, all of them and countries around the world were very quick to open up um, various routes. Ireland went visa free. Um, the UK opened two to three schemes for um, Ukraine nationals to enter. It was all done very quickly. Mm. Do you think there's a chance of that happening for Palestinian people? I uh, was very quick out the gate um, when this latest conflagration started um, uh, to call on the Irish government. So the the temporary reception directive is, mm-hmm. is what... Uh, it was actually passed a good number of years ago, but had never been extended to any particular uh, issue until yeah, the Ukrainian Ukraine, issue. That's right. Um, so the Ukrainian people were the first people to benefit from that, and rightly so. Mm-hmm. Del- I was delighted. One, one of my best pals, um, head coach of uh, Smithfield Boxing Club, a uh, little plug for Smithfield Boxing Club, Igor Camille is from yeah. Ukraine. Great guy, one of my best pals, and I was delighted. So why doesn't that protection exactly. get extended to the Palestinian people? At the moment, you know, um, and unfortunately, our Taoiseach said very clearly on the radio mm. only two weeks ago or last week, whatever it was on the Claire Byrne show, uh, that's different, you know. That's different. You know, wow. and I just, I just, like that sticks in my craw. I, there are words that I could use, but I, I won't on this podcast, but yeah, I, I, it really, really angered me, I have to say. Yeah. Um, I just, I don't understand why uh, Palestinians aren't treated the same as Ukrainians. Yes, I mean, it's a case of deferential treatment across the board. As lawyers, you're focusing on people from so many war-stricken regions, fleeing persecution on an epic scale. And it is just astounding to have clients for, well, in my experience, for example, from Afghanistan, who were literally promised a route to the UK by the government, long forgotten about now. The routes are closed or never happened, while at the same time, you know, myself and my colleagues would have been preparing visas 
um, you know, and Irish lawyers as well, providing support where they can um, for Ukrainian families, which is fantastic. And, you know, we're delighted to do so and delighted to see such prompt action um, and such an urgent response to the crisis there. And it's ongoing, of course. Um, you know, and the schemes, for example, largely appear to be to have worked. But practically speaking, I guess... We all feel a bit helpless and a little bit lost at the moment. There's very little that we can do. But what, if anything, can lawyers now do for Palestine? I suppose I'm talking globally as well. Um, I mean, I've seen a series of open letters for lawyers to voice their condemnation. We mentioned one before the recording. Um, Well, certainly that letter, um, myself and a group of other people spent a while working on that letter. Um, It was printed in the Examiner newspaper in the South. Um, I know that there was a, a letter also prepared by lawyers in, in Britain, the yeah. UK, um, and lawyers in Australia. I'm sure others have done it as well. Um, that's I, I think that's a strong thing to do. Uh, also, I know that the Law Society has made a statement. I haven't actually seen the statement myself, to be honest with you. Um, the Law Society have made a statement in relation to um, what's happening in Palestine and Gaza. Um, I think as lawyers, we can advocate yeah. uh, and say, look, uh, I, I, you're, you're going to come on to international humanitarian law in a moment, but I think we can, as lawyers, we have to point out that what's happening is, you know, in breach of all the Geneva Conventions, international humanitarian law norms. You know, we, we as lawyers, we have to. People say this is wrong, but yeah. we have to be able to give the structure and say, well, here's how it's wrong. Mm-hmm. Here's how the the relevant statutes, the relevant laws, the relevant international human rights norms are being breached. And on a regular basis, we have to give the structure for um, people to say this is how it's actually criminally wrong. I mean, you only have to read the UN reports, there's hundreds of them, um, and other reports on the occupied territories where inquiries have already declared that Israel had been party to serious breaches of international law. I mean, it's systemic, really. Um, We wouldn't have time to go through them all in in one show. Um, But why has nothing been done? I mean... What can you say about that? Why are we witnessing a genocide unfold in real time? What's the point of the law that cannot effectively protect children, for example, at the bare minimum? If I was a young Palestinian uh, growing up, particularly in Gaza or in the West Bank, um, and seeing how the international community are just actually supporting genocide at the moment, um, I would be so frustrated and angry. But... um, Something that you mentioned earlier on is relevant here, I think, in that um, the Tories and their Stop the Boats campaign, Mm -hmm. their Rwanda campaign, their Rwanda plan was brought to the Supreme Court. And the the UK Supreme Court gave a strong decision and said, it's unlawful. The next day, Rishi Sunak came out and said he's going to change the law. law. So it's very clear that, you know, the famous phrase, the law is an ass. (laughs) The law is being changed or ignored or or massaged or manipulated to suit the political interests of colonial powers and I know that's a very political thing to say but yeah. that is the case um, is. and I think we also have to look at the UN Security Council yeah like look at all the resolutions that have exactly. been passed against Israel mm-hmm. ab- against the occupa- the ongoing occupation since 1967 and nothing has happened because of the veto powers yeah. of particularly of America and Britain to a letter, lesser extent. Um, so while, you know, the law is there, mm-hmm. but it's not being implemented because it's being blocked or it's being ignored. Um, and then you also have Israel is not a party to, to, it, the, yeah, to the Rome Statute, so they, the ICC won't ex- extend to them anyway. Um, so, you know, there are ways mm-hmm. that th- th- these powerful nations can just, they can talk about... Mm-hmm. You know, what, and again, it enrages me. Um, they talk about, you know, the West as being the civilised West. Look at how uncivilised they are. The, s- the public statements of Rishi Sunak and some of the, t- the Tories, like literally advocating, you know, the, the, the slaughter of Palestinians. Yeah. Yes, we're all facing a pretty grim and depressing reality right now. And none of us know how matters will play out, but we shall soon see. I was supposed Beyond. to travel to Cairo this week to, to join the international peace convoy that wanted to travel to the, the Rafa crossing and the Egyptian government mm. refused to grant permission to anybody, right. Egyptians or internationals. Um, 
but I, I, it's absolutely critical that as many people as possible, like we've had constant marches in Dublin yeah. um, and around the country, and I know they've happened in Belfast as well, mm. and we've had speakers from the north coming down to speak at our, yeah. at, at our rallies as well. Um, Jerry Carroll spoke at, at a right. rally we had outside the Doyle when we had a number of motions, which were all defeated by the Irish government, by the way, including That's the Green right. Party. I couldn't believe that. Yeah, it was really, really terrible. And th- there was motions again this week and the Irish government refused to... Uh, to um, uh, so they were talking... Th- I can't remember the exact te- text of the motion, but the, it deplored the loss of life, but it wouldn't... It refused to add in words to say killed by Israel. Yeah. It, yeah. it voted that down. So uh, as always happens, and as is reported in the media... Palestinians just die. They just yeah. miraculously die. Israelis are, are murdered, slaughtered, and uh, cannot condone killing of anybody. No. But it always seems to be reported that Palestinians just miraculously die. Mm-hmm. And it, 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 it's just the imbalance and the, and the, the unfairness is really galling. Yes, I mean, it's been incredibly disheartening as Israel day after day, I mean, been pounding Gaza. And the press, leaders, those in governments are just using inaccurate language and blatantly obvious bias when it comes to the issue. It's incredibly dangerous and seeks to almost dehumanise Palestinians. So it's vital um, to call them out in this alone. Um, So, Gary, just moving on, you join me today. um, And again, thank you for doing so. Haven't had to close your office today. Um, your practice is in Dublin city centre and it was for the safety of your own sta- staff. Um, so people may have heard, a lot of listeners may not know about this, but last night riots erupted in Dublin following a shocking knife attack, um, an awful event, where three children and an adult um, were attacked. One of the children, I think, is, is said to be seriously injured. Um, kind of little d- details now, I'm sure lots will unfold throughout the day. But following this attack, uh, violent clashes broke out across the city centre. Vehicles were torched. Police have been attacked. The guards were attacked. And the looting of businesses um, was just uh, really widespread. And it's been described as having been carried out by the media, I guess I'm I'm looking at, by a far-right mob. Um, So this is all still very fresh. Um, Apologies that I don't have full details, but um, the images... Um, are really deeply disturbing and worrying. Um, I've lots to say about that, I guess. I, I, I'm a member of a, an organisation called Lakela. Lakela is a, is a Gaelga phrase for together. And we set up Lakela a few years ago um, to provide an alternative rather than, I don't like saying counteract, I think to provide an alternative, particularly to young people, mm because the far right were, were growing. Mm-hmm. Uh, in 2019, I think it was, a direct provision centre was opened in Uchtarard in Galway. And uh, there was uh, really strong protests against it. And that was kind of the first that I remember, certainly, um, where people showed real opposition to, to, to refugees coming to Ireland. And that caught on for a while, uh, but it hadn't happened in Dublin. There's lots of refugee centres in Dublin. And then uh, it was slated that there was uh, there would be a refugee centre opened in uh, an all disused electricity supply board building in East Wall. And then um, more refugees, and, and sorry, there was a, a big protest against that in East Wall. And then there was protests in Ballymun. And so it... it the protesting in Dublin really took off. So I've been involved in uh, trying to figure out, to, with, with this group and lots mm. of our uh, activists all <coughs> across Dublin and across the country, like yeah. really brilliant and lifelong committed activists, anti-racism activists, community activists, lots of people. And funnily enough, the Tidy Towns committees have been great really? to well, engage yeah. in this in this work. Um, but there's a lot of work going on in communities all across the country, particular, particularly in Dublin. Um, but we we were organising counter-protests against anti-refugee protests. Um, And that was certainly, I I think it was important that we sent a message to immigrants and refugees in Ireland that we were, you know, there were Irish people prepared to oppose that and to stand in solidarity with them. We had one at the Red Cow Hotel 
there's a famous roundabout, the Red yes, Cow I Hotel. Know it. Yeah, <laughs> there's no roundabout there anymore, but the Red Cow Hotel is there, and there's lots of, of asylum seekers staying in the hotel. Mm-hmm. And the far right came to protest at that hotel, I think, in January, and it was an awful mm-hmm. night. It was lashing rain and it was freezing. And we had a counter protest. So we stood outside the hotel, and they stood outside the hotel. The, the, the wall of the hotel and the two groups shouted at each other. But the people in the hotel came out and said, thank you so much. And that was yeah. that was nice and it was affirming. But, you know, in, in this group that I'm involved in and, and wider groups, we always felt that something bigger, something stronger had to be done. Um, so we organised an Ireland for All demonstration, uh, a welcoming demonstration uh, on in February of this year and it was you know there was a massive amount of people really massive mm. amount of people how many people showed up is still a matter for for debate between 35 and 50,000 people um and um so that seemed to kind of calm things down a bit for a prolonged period of time but look what happened yesterday the stabbing of of um a, a, a woman in her 30s and at least three children one of whom I understand is in a really serious condition and a really good friend of mine who's involved in Lakeila with me witnessed it because oh, wow. the stabbing happened outside a school which is right beside where the Stardust Inquiry is happening and the people involved in the uh, giving evidence and who were at the mm-hmm. Stardust Inquiry came out to see what was happening so this friend of mine witnessed with her own eyes and I spoke to her for over an hour on the phone I spoke to her again this morning and she was just in shock and this is a you know this woman has been involved in lots of stuff for many years a really fantastic woman and she was just stunned really shocked by what happened the 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 man who did the stabbing was you know it seemed look there's just no describing what happened Mm -hmm. so that i like what happened why there's no rationalizing it so absolutely one can understand that people will be angry that women and children have been stabbed hurt Absolutely, that anger at, and f- and fear, fear and anger go together, as mm-hmm. I'm sure you know. So um, it is absolutely right that people will be angry that this would happen. I'm angry that some mm-hmm. crazy yeah, lunatic just, yeah. stabbed and hurt innocent kids. Like there's just literally nothing worse you can think about. But to then extrapolate that and say that all immigrants and uh, what really angered me was, you know, going on social media and seeing people who should know an awful lot better trying to m- to manipulate a really awful situation and, and kids being hurt. And they're going, you know, this is, oh, we have to close the, you know, we have to close the door, no more immigrants. That's it. Every immigrant in Ireland mm-hmm. gets, gets tarnished by the, the same, mm-hmm. by the brush, you know, by one lunatic. Um, so... What happened in Dublin last night, I think... So, y- you mentioned earlier on that they were all far right. I I, I was... There was there was um, a very small encampment of refugees in Sandwich Street. I don't know if you heard about yes. what happened there. I was there um, the night that they, they burnt that out. I was part of the counter-protest to stop them from attacking the refugees. And it was a really dangerous situation, a really volatile situation. And there were people at the front these fellas with their selfie sticks and you know them you know who i'm talking about on these online clickbait people who just they're trying to make a name for themselves Mm -hmm. you know that they have no real you know they're only doing it for notoriety and Mm -hmm. to make money Mm -hmm. um i I, look a lot of people know who they are i'm not going to even give them the dignity of naming them but there were other young people there that yeah. night in Sandwich Street, and they're just disaffected, uh, marginalised, angry young people who are, you know, they've been left behind, yeah. and I don't think they're far right. No. I, I train with young lads in. I, I you mentioned earlier, I do jujitsu. I train with young people, but it's mostly young lads that I train with. So we, I do my best to have conversations with them as often as possible and sometimes I'll get messages from them on Facebook as well I heard you talking in the dressing room or you know I saw you posted something about this you know can you tell me and they'll they'll ask a few questions and then they'll go away and think about it and then you'll meet them in the dressing room then three weeks later I was thinking about that you know it's really important to engage in conversations with young people particularly from my perspective yeah. as somebody who was you know I'm an alpha now but I'm still <laughs> I'm still doing jiu-jitsu when I was a fighter 
um, to sit down and talk to people because they don't, they genuinely are curious, you know, and those young people, young lads in particular, as I say, in my case, um, they can be tipped over the edge um, into far right beliefs very easily because they're being led in by older people. And I was listening to an, an interview on the radio this morning where uh, the person who was giving their recount of what they had seen last night in Dublin City were saying that there were older men directing younger lads. To, you go over and do that. You set that cop car on fire. You do this or you do that or you do the other. They were directing them. And the young, oh yeah, I'll do that. They were being wound up and sent off. But those young lads are the young lads that but are probably get, now yeah. in, in, in the courts exactly. this morning. And that they're going to face now the all the appropriate and the older men, the, the, the wiser heads, they, you know, they sent these young fellas off, off to do these. Yeah. Exactly. And they'll step back. Those are the people mm -hmm. that are, th that's who I really have an anger towards. Yeah. The young lads, I just want to sit them down and have a conversation with them and say, lads, Jesus. Yeah. You know, you're looking up at lads in MMA and the UFC or soccer or whatever else. And they're from countries all over the world. Yeah, you see. Yeah. And, and y you're, you're just trying to help them join the dots and say, did you ever think about, you know, you know the lad that you rolled with last week? His family are refugees. They're from mm. such and such a place. Or, you know, you're training in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. <laughs> <laughs> like, there are Brazilian people training here in the club, and yet yeah. you're saying close the doors, you know? I and know. what are you saying? Are you saying oh, we close the door only to white people? Mm -hmm. or to, to people of colour, yeah. you know, and you're, you, it's, you're trying to ask questions in a way that's not confrontational, but in a way that you're trying to, to get them... In a rational way and a realistic way so they can understand just from, you know, their perception, their reality around them. To, Ex know, but from their own life experience, yeah, exactly. what's important to them? Oh, but I never thought that, yeah. you know, whoever, Jose Aldo or whoever else, oh, he's a man of colour. Oh, you're yeah. Jesus, you know that you say it. But yeah, it's important that they come to these conclusions themselves. themselves. Yeah. Trying to preach to people and say, you must think this. They will react in a completely negative way. Mm -hmm. And I know I would have, you know. Yeah. Um, but there are also politicians, and again, I'm not going to name people. You have plenty of them in the north mm -hmm. as well, who were making, trying to make capital out of, of, out of this yeah. situation. And it's unbelievably irresponsible. Mm -hmm. And to go back to Palestine, by the way, I watched a very interesting documentary on Netflix last week and um, they were talking about Netanyahu and when Yitzhak Rabin was murdered. Mm -hmm. uh, leading up to that, he was leading marches against the the peace talks that were going on between Rabin and, and, and Yasser Arafat. And he was fomenting violence. No doubt about it. And the death of Rabin it was very made very clear in this documentary they they believe that the death of Rabin was certainly in in large part to the to the rhetoric of of Netanyahu God, these people th you know these demagogues and yeah. Trump is the same yeah. and Bolsonaro they're unbelievably reckless mm -hmm. but i don't think sorry when i say reckless it's reckless what they're doing but they're very calculated yes. on their part they know exactly what they're doing but there are people who were on social media in Ireland last night who who made statements on their social media last night, and I I know some of them, and I'm really annoyed over what was yeah. said because that the kind of stuff that was said, the inflammatory language that was used, young lads who were impressionable were looking at that. I, yeah, yeah, right. And that's exactly what they yeah. This narrative is quite widespread. Uh, you, Gary, have worked extensively on homelessness issues, as you said, you're very active around the housing crisis, but. Time and time again, and this isn't in reference to just social media or, you know, people who, who should know better, but we just hear it in our everyday lives. Well, you know, what about the homeless and why don't we look after our own and, you know, can't we look after them first? The f first thing I would always say is it's a very easy slogan to throw Isn't out. it? Yeah. yeah. Look after our own first. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So who are our, our own? Mm -hmm. Are you saying people only born on the island of Ireland? Since when? And are you talking about travellers as well? by the way. And oh, well, uh, uh, oh, yeah. the first thing you say, <coughs> ask them what their position on providing housing for travellers. If you remember, you may remember, Sarah, the, the presidential election, um, the last president, uh, presidential election, there was a man called Peter Casey who was at 1%. And then there was a story about travellers in um, 
Tipperary, I think it was, and there was an issue in relation to building a wall at their house. Yeah. And, you know, some, uh, one of the gutter press ran a story and, you know, were using this to attack the traveller community in Ireland. And Peter Casey jumped on this story and, you know, oh, this is terrible. And, you know, and he went from 1% of the polls to 23% of the polls. So the anti-traveller animus, and it's something I feel particularly strong about, and we take lots of cases in relation to traveller discrimination. Yeah. We could do a whole podcast on that, I yeah. think. Um, but, uh, sorry, the, the point is, when people say, throw out these ridiculous, you know, look after our own first. Okay, so who is our own? Are you talking about everybody on the island of Ireland? Are you talking about people from the north, for example? And are you talking about then people from... Britain who are Irish who are coming back home to live should they be like home and, and start analysing the different yeah, levels of are you talking about EU people are mm-hmm. you saying no or yes to EU people are you saying people of colour so what yeah. what exactly are, who is our own let's let's look at the phrase you use, look after and then let's look at look at what do you mean by look after mm-hmm. the government haven't looked after you know it's exactly. the lack of building social housing that's what has led us to this issue. And they stopped building social housing in 2008. And before that, um, Rory Hearn, Dr. Rory Hearn, I'm sure he, he lectures, I think, in Maynooth, he's written at least one book on it, uh, a book called Gaffs. And it's a history of ha- social housing in Ireland. A, a brilliant man. And, uh, you know, these issues, yeah. if, there was, if there were no refugees, and that's the real, yeah. that's the real kind of, when they say look after our own first, I mean, don't let the refugees get, get housing. If there were no refugees coming to Ireland, we would still have a social exactly. housing issue. And that's the fundamental point here. So it, I, I, I always try and just peel away layer after layer after, okay, well, let's, let's take that phrase, what exactly do you mean? Mm-hmm. Well... Uh, no doubt there'll be continued discussion around this and how to contain this type of violence. And I hope everyone affected is supported and that the victims of the attack are receiving the care that they need. Um, so just moving on a little bit. So the interaction between activism and the law is very evident in your work, Gary. Uh, that goes without saying, both within your professional capacity as a solicitor, but also outside your actual day-to-day work. And let's say we could have a few podcast episodes to cover all of that. I might not even cover it. But um, the question we ask everyone, and I'm really interested to hear your perspective, is how, through the law and activism, can we make effective change? Um, well... I, I'm very hesitant, and, and certainly uh, given this analogy, but if you, if, because I certainly am not putting myself in the same category, but if you look at some of the leaders of some of our, rev- our revolutions over the years, like Pori Pierce, Wolf Tone, they were lawyers, you know. Um, I think studying the law gives you a real understanding of how the levers of society work. Um, mm-hmm. Now, I'm sure economists would say the same thing, but certainly from my perspective, I think. A study, studying of the law, of constitutional law, of uh, of you know all the different branches of law, gives you a real understanding of how um, the the structures of the state work, how they exec- exert power and control over individuals, yeah. and as a lawyer, you can, in understanding how those structures work, you can then help people to. I don't want to sound like a you know too much of a revolutionary, but to fight back against injustice, yeah. and if that means understanding, well, the, you know, for example, helping people who are being illegally evicted. I was involved in, I was involved in a case there a few years ago, where um, a landlord was evicting a group of people, the majority of whom were migrants, and um, he hadn't. The, the landlord hadn't served anything other than had done up his own notice of eviction and had given to the guards and the guards thought for whatever reason and it uh, still astounds me they thought this was a lawful eviction and they went along and they assisted as the landlord sent in heavies who smashed up the place in front of the tenants wow. 
And so they, they, com- they came from the place to my office and they sat in front of me and they handed me and they said, this is what we were given, is this law? I said, what, what is that? Something off the internet. They hadn't been to the RTB, the Residential Tenancies mm-hmm. Board. There had been no district court order enforcing the order of the RTB. So there was nothing lawful in what, and, and yet the guards were there mistakenly and I just I, it's to, to this day I can't and this isn't the only time this has happened they were there to enforce that order so I rang the superintendent in the in the guard station where this was happening and I said how is this lawful what, what what's going on and we had an argument back and forward on the phone for 10 minutes until he realised actually there's no wow. legal basis for this and then the guards left oh my goodness and the people went back in so yeah because as a lawyer I was able to look at this piece of paper and say there's no yeah. legitimacy there was no you know this cannot be enforced mm-hmm. by any arm of the state let alone particularly the guards I was able to help in that scenario now they only came to me because the activists who were involved the housing activists they knew enough to come to me and they knew that this was wrong but they felt yeah. this might need a lawyer mm-hmm. but then there is a group in, in the south, I'm not, I'm not sure if they're running the six counties, but CATU they're called, and they're a tenants union, and they are absolutely fantastic. Mm-hmm. Again, a group of young people, some of whom were involved in Apollo House, by the way. Right, uh, okay. And CATU yeah. are on a county-by-county county basis in the south, and they're doing fantastic work. So CATU were involved in that eviction, Brilliant. and um, they're helping to combat a lot of illegal evictions, which are going on every day. Finally, Gary, for anyone who is interested in following in your footsteps and embarking on a career like yours and getting involved in activism and the law, what advice would you have for them? Well, if if they want to do human rights law, mm. uh, it's uh, like you know this yourself, Sarah. Human rights is a vast area. Yeah. Uh, what what are, what are human rights to one person might necessarily be human rights to another. Mm-hmm. So I think what's really important first and foremost is to figure out because you're you're never going to the work that you and I do. Mm. You're never going to invest all the time and energy into it unless you feel from somewhere deep inside you that this is something that I have to do. Mm. It's not oh I have an interest in this like I like watching Game of Thrones or whatever, yeah. you know, I, I like, you have to really feel passionately mm-hmm. about it. So before you jump into the area, I think it's really important to uh, get involved in support groups or whatever, whatever to, if it's traveller activism mm-hmm. or refugees or Palestine or uh, the Kurdish people or, you know, any, any or, 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 you know, women's rights, abortion, yeah. access to abortion, whatever it is, um, or children's rights. Like, these are all areas yeah. that you know are are areas that need young energetic lawyers yeah Uh, um but if it's something that you really want to dedicate yourself to i think you need to immerse yourself in it for a while first uh, as a young person and say oh god yeah on and and see a pathway say as a lawyer this is something i could do Mm -hmm. this there's something i could do here to make a difference to advocate on behalf of people or whatever it is but you you uh, like I I'm I have young people coming into me all the time. I'm an elf and elf, so <laughs> people coming into me all the time, uh, and I'm very happy to have the. Con- I think it's really important. Uh, yeah. Part of my activism is to relay my experiences to those mm-hmm. people and say, well, look, if I had known when I was 25 what I know now, maybe I would have done X, Y, and Z differently. Yeah. So I would suggest to you that you join this organ. Mm. If it's the Ireland Palestine Solidarity Campaign or flack or whatever it is join that group work with them for a while but most importantly meet the people that are directly affected yeah you know work with travelers work with refugees work with with women work with what whatever group it is that you feel most strongly about listen to their stories and listen to what it is that is happening that is affecting their lives that you think actually I could work in that area and and make a difference to do something. So invaluable advice for anyone listening and a really really insightful and interesting discussion about your work using the law and activism. So Gary thank you for joining me today. Thanks everyone for joining me today. If you like the show, please remember to share and leave a review if you have a moment. And you can also check out our website, www.activistlawyer.com, where you will see some blog articles written by our guests and contributors, as well as some fabulous Activist Lawyer merchandise. This podcast was recorded in Granite Podcast Studio. 
Interested in starting up your own podcast but don't know how? Granite Podcast Studio can help. Record your podcast in our state-of-the-art studio, which is based in the heart of Newry City. Our studio has cutting-edge and user-friendly technology and can seat up to four people. We also provide an editing service for our team using your guidance and editing notes to provide you with a flawless finished product, leaving your listeners wanting more. For more information on how you can get started, visit www.granitepodcaststudio.com.